when I began this uh, series on hi-fi tube amplifiers, I intended to stop after the Williamson and cathode loading of amplifiers, including the ultralinear. But someone asked a question about why I never talked about the amplifier that uh, I began the whole series with. That is the radio electronics twin coupled amplifier that appeared in this article. And it's a very good question. Uh, so I decided to go back and, and include this in the series. But before I do, there's a couple of things that I need to point out. Uh, one is I wanted to go back and look at the uh, ultralinear amplifier very briefly and remind everyone that this picture, which purports to show the uh, plate characteristics of a tetrode amplifier, a triode amplifier, and in the dotted lines the ultralinear, is a kind of idealized curve. The reason is, if you just look at the curve itself, you'll see that actually if you were to draw the uh, the sum of these two, you would get something that peaks up this way and then comes through here and drops off a little bit more that way. But the reality is the ultralinear amplifier was not perfectly linear, which this straight line implies. This book, the Radiotron Designer's Handbook, this particular copy was published by RCA, but the, uh, the volume was published by a number of people, by F. Langford Smith, is sort of the Bible of tube, that is, electron tube equipment. And in this, I would uh, like to show you a chart that comes from the ultralinear amplifier. And in this chart, what they are showing is the power output and the, the, the distortion, what you see is that there is a particular sweet spot of about 4,000 ohms load resistance. This is the load resistance. In other words, the, the, what the transformer is presenting. This is both the power output in watts as well as the total distortion. So what you're seeing is that in addition to there being a sweet spot with regard to distortion and power output, there also is a sweet spot with regard to load resistance. That's important in a minute when you start looking at how the different kinds of feedback are affected by the load resistance. Before I go into twin coupled amplifiers, I would like to review a little bit about feedback. And I'm primarily going to be using this article by Norm Crowhurst. It appeared in the September 1953 edition. So it predates the twin coupled amplifier that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But I need to do this for a number of reasons. You may recall that the Williamson amplifier was a uh, feedback amplifier, and that was one of the major improvements that Williamson made. The first thing that anyone trying to apply feedback should understand is there are actually several different ways you can uh, do negative feedback. One way is to sense the output voltage, which is the way Williamson used, that is to sense the output uh, and in the case of the Williamson amplifier, this is actually the output of the transformer. So in other words, you're sensing the voltage that's going to the speaker. Well, you'll see there are some problems with that in a minute. There's a second way to uh, do that, and that is to sense the voltage across a resistor in series with the output. The difference is this is pure voltage feedback. This is actually current feedback. In other words, it's the current in the output circuit that you are sensing, but you're sensing it as a voltage across a resistor. 
Well, consider what happens when you're sensing the voltage and you get a very low impedance across the output. Of course, uh, and very low might include a short. Well, part of the problem is that at that point you lose all your feedback signal if you have a short across the output. And the lower the impedance of the speaker, the less the feedback. Well, as you know, speaker impedances vary. So basically, the amount of feedback varies in uh, this amplifier. And that was one of the problems with the uh, Williamson and, and its derivatives. On the other hand, if you use a current sense uh, like this, and you short the output, well, the feedback actually increases. That is, it cuts the gain down. Well, for example, consider what happens if somebody shorts the output of their amplifier and it has a lot of negative feedback to hold the gain down. Then, because they're not getting any output, they don't realize they've shorted the output. Maybe they think they've connected a speaker, but they've actually connected uh, a wire that has a short in it. They turn up the volume. Well, the higher the volume goes, the higher the output signal tries to go, but because there's no feedback, the amplifier gain is actually higher. So for each volume setting, the output amplifier is actually working harder with a dead short than it was if there had actually been a speaker there. Well, what a lot of people wound up doing is they would hook up a speaker, or thought they had, it really was a short, they didn't hear anything so they'd turn up the volume, and the amplifier would basically burn out its output transformer trying to drive enough output to produce some feedback. So these were some of the problems that occurred. Let me show you uh, another problem with feedback. On the screen is a network analyzer output from an audio amplifier. At the top is shown the frequency response. At the bottom is the phase response of the amplifier. Well, if you notice, the phase response goes from uh, about 360 degrees, and I apologize if you can't read this. I've blown it up so big that the uh, numbers don't read very easily, but I'll kind of tell you what they are. Goes from almost 360 degrees, that is positive feedback, down to zero degrees, which once again is positive feedback. Only at 180 in the center here are you getting true negative feedback. So only at that frequency are you getting exactly 180 degrees of of negative uh, feedback. If you fed this back at these frequencies, this frequency and even at that frequency, this amplifier would oscillate because it's positive feedback. That was one of the problems with these uh, feedback amplifiers. We looked at how you can derive the feedback signal, both voltage and current. Let's also look at how you can apply the feedback signal. And there are two ways to do that. One is to use the signal in series with the input. That is, uh, open the path and the feedback signal is fed between those two points. The other way is to apply the feedback signal across the input signal, so-called shunt feedback. The reason that I bring all of this up is because all of these forms of feedback are what are called single-ended feedback. And as you'll see in a little bit, when we look at the uh, twin-coupled amplifier, one of its differences, that is uh, one of the things that separates it from the Williamson and the ultralinear and the uh, cathode loaded amplifiers, is it uses push-pull feedback. Now, before we move on to the twin coupled amplifier, I will also point out one other thing. Feedback only works for correlated signals. It's a fancy word for signals that continue over and over again to do the same thing. In other words, obsessive compulsive signals. If you have a feedback amplifier like this and you have noise at the input, by the time that noise is propagated all the way to the output and then been fed back to the input, it's gone. In other words, random events 
are not taken care of by feedback. In fact, random events make things worse because a random noise spike comes in, is propagated through the amplifier, the speaker goes through a transition trying to keep up with that fast spike, then it feeds back a signal, but by the time it gets back to the cathode of this tube, that signal, that spike is gone. So it's actually trying to correct for the normal signal. So it drives the gain of this stage down. So you not only get the spike, but then you get the reverse spike. That is the spike due to feedback when the feedback tries to correct for something that's no longer there. So now let's look at twin coupled amplifiers in a little more detail. And once again, if you're interested in getting this particular one, it's the November 1957 issue of Radio Electronics. Here is an example of an impedance curve for a typical amplifier or for a uh, typical loudspeaker connected to an amplifier. You'll notice that at low frequencies there tends to be a resonant peak where the impedance goes up. Then you pass that resonant frequency and it drops off. And then the inductance of the voice coil begins to take over and it continues to rise after that. Now, as Norman Crowhurst points out in his article on the twin coupled amplifier, proper voltage feedback can help to correct for this. But it also has a number of disadvantages that we are going to have talked about. And so what he decided to do in this case was to use push-pull feedback. So let's look at how that happens. And before we do that, let's look at why this is called a twin coupled amplifier. Here is the output transformer and power output tubes of the twin coupled amplifier. Notice, starting from the output, the secondary, that is the speaker windings of this transformer are paralleled with the speaker windings of this. Not just the ground and the uh, highest impedance, but every one of them is paired. So the 4 ohm, the 8 ohm, the 16 ohm are all paired or paralleled. Then, Notice that the plate of this tube is connected to the blue wire of this primary. The cathode of this is connected to the brown wire of this primary, and the blue wire of this primary is connected to the cathode of this tube. This plate is connected to the brown wire of this transformer. In other words, they are cross-connected. And this is why this is called a twin coupled amplifier and why it is appropriate to talk about this after we talked about cathode loading. If you recall in uh, part two that Macintosh used in uh, connection that cross-coupled the screens and the plates. If you look at the screen grid of this uh, tube, it is connected to the plate of this tube. Similarly, this screen grid is connected to the plate of that tube. So what you have here is the use of two transformers to achieve the cross-coupled screen technique used by Macintosh, as well as the cathode loading. So you might describe this as a very advanced amplifier. The last thing we should talk about is the type of feedback used in this amplifier. It's actually push-pull feedback. You may recall the Williamson used a single-ended feedback from the output of the transformer back to the input stage. This amplifier feeds from the cathode of each output tube via this line and into the cathode of this amplifier, but it also feeds from this cathode back to that same 
cathode. So it's using negative feedback, but in part because it's using an internal point in the circuit, it's not as subject to impedance variations in the loudspeaker, and because it is push-pull feedback, it solves a problem which was present in most amplifiers of this time that when the tubes switched, that is when the push-pull output tube switched from the main amount of output power being supplied by one tube to the main power being supplied by the other, they produced a, a form of distortion due in part to the feedback, or maybe I should say enhanced or made worse by the feedback. If you feedback from both tubes, in effect, you can eliminate a large amount of that distortion, or maybe a better way to put it is, it doesn't contribute to the distortion like the feedback does in a regular Williamson amplifier. Now, before leaving this topic, I should point out that there is a subsequent article called Updating the Twin Coupled Amplifier, which I think appeared in June of 1960. And those of you that watched part one will recall that this was actually the first article that got me interested in high fidelity. The purpose of this article, however, was to point out a number of difficulties that people building this amplifier were having, including motorboating when they tried to power a preamp off the same power supply, loss of base, uh, low gain, and other things. And I won't try to go into the details, but basically the uh, what I would suggest is that you read the updating this uh, twin-coupled amplifier as well because taken with the, the original construction article, it produces a much better picture of, the, uh, of this particular form of, uh, of amplifier. Finally, there was a high-power twin-coupled amplifier produced. This one, however, was not nearly as popular as the original, partly because by this time, commercial amplifiers were readily available and frankly the the people trying to build their own amplifiers had run into enough problems that commercial amplifiers had solved involving layout and lead dress and other construction techniques that you can afford to build several prototypes for a commercial amplifier but of course a DIYer is not going to uh, want to build four or five amplifiers just to get one that works. For that reason, as well as the fact that stereo was coming in and a number of other things, by the time this article came out on the high-powered uh, twin-coupled amplifier, interest was beginning to wane on the home-built hi-fi amp. So. I hope that this has been useful to those of you that whose interest might have been piqued by my mentioning of the twin coupled amplifier at the beginning. And overall, I hope that all three parts of this uh, Hi-Fi tube amp series have been useful and informative. I will probably do some additional videos on Hi-Fi amplifiers, but I think at this point I'm going to call it the end of this particular series on the hi-fi tube amps of the late 1950s.